On behalf of the Badminton Pan American Confederation, we warmly welcome you to our Coach Corner program. My name is Richard Wong, and it is my pleasure once again to be today's moderator. In this session, we are pleased to have one of the most outstanding researchers in our sport. Let me introduce you to Dr. Yundi Chai Smith from the USA, who will talk to us today about an important topic, invisible training, the importance of motivation in young badminton players. Before handing over to our guest, allow me to tell you a little bit about Dr. Smith. She is a clinical lecturer in the Department of Teacher Education at Loyola University in Maryland. She has a PhD in educational psychology from the University at Albany State University of New York. She's currently developing college level courses and continuing education modules to prepare college students for coaching careers. Dr. Chai Smith commits her professional life towards advocating for the rights of youth athletes and protecting their safety. Good afternoon, Dr. Smith, and welcome to our program. Thank you for um, sharing with our audience and receiving us from your home in Maryland. We invite you to take control and share your screen. Okay, uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully this is a good evening somewhere uh, in all of the world. Uh, thanks, uh, Badminton Pan Am, give us a chance and all the coaches and myself uh, to, ex uh, to exchange our experience on this uh, very important topic. And we all agree the motivation is play the big part of the juniors uh, uh, participating uh, in this sport. Um, let me start with my... Uh, so we all agree the positive uh, motivation, which is uh, drive us to play better, to train harder, to play creatively, uh, mostly to enjoy the sport much more. And negative uh, motivation, uh, which is will, will kind of cause a lot of a stress, pressure, especially pressure to win, and also uh, the burned out for a lot of uh, players, especially elite players, which is we, we uh, witness uh, this kind of uh, uh, consequences, uh, some uh, elite player during Olympics or uh, more recent US Open tennis. So some, for a lot of junior, their problem will be falling to between about lack of motivation. Lack of motivation will drive the kids uh, out of the sport, uh, decrease their enjoyment of the, the sport, and drop out or withdraw. So in today's, I want to share my uh, research and uh, my experience about how to uh, identify uh, the influence uh, to the junior's motivation and participant uh, in this sport, especially badminton. And also uh, how do we increase that uh, gaining control for their own sport, their own activity. And at the same time, we were trying to uh, to create some uh, uh, opportunity to um, develop some proper goals for uh, children uh, to play, to participate in this sport. Okay. All right, so before that, um, for the, uh, I did a little informal survey to uh, about, 42 junior players after junior nationals this year at the United States. Uh, I collect some uh, data uh, to uh, ask them some question about their motivation to play, about their motivation uh, to keep doing training and their uh, excuses uh, when they perform not as well. So uh, this is a group of an elite uh, badminton player in the jun junior elite player in the United States, which is about, I would say uh, 21 male, mostly uh, 15 females. And uh, some of them didn't answer or prefer not to answer about this question. And the majority of this, uh, 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 of the kids who participate in the sport are between age uh, 13 to 15. So well, first of question is, uh, I want them to up to the Likert like scale from zero to 10. How much you like to play badminton? So we got a very encouraged answer, response from them. It's almost nine out of the 10 as a response to how much they prefer to play. And also when I asked them how much they like to train, it's a slightly lower 
their preferences to play, but not significantly. So statistically, we cannot say they prefer playing than training, but it is also very high, uh, almost 7.5 out of 10, uh, their preferences to train. So this is very encouraged for the, uh, the kids in the United States. Uh, they seem like very enjoy of a participant in this sport. And then I asked them a question. What motivated you to play? What, what make you come to train? What make you uh, come to the club to participate, to play uh, with your friends or train with your coaches? Oh. So most of the responses were falling to, I want to be a better player. I want to uh, learn some skill a little bit better. I want to perform better. So majority of the kids, the answer is like, I want to be a better player. But if you dig in more about why you want to be a better player, then they will say, the answer would be very uh, different. Some of them will say, oh, I want to represent my country uh, the next year, Pan Am. I wanted to uh, be a number one player in the United States. Some of them will say, oh, it's fun because it's just fun. So very interestingly, this answer have age differences. So for the older players, uh, especially 17, 18 years old players, their answer will be very specific. They will not fall into, I want to be a better player. The answer will be right away say, I want to prepare for the tournament. Some, some even say specific tournament they prepare for. For the younger player on the other hand, uh, let's say some eight years old, nine years old, their uh, answer will be, it's fun. I want to know new friends uh, because my parents take me. So the age either very young or very old, they know what exactly motivate them to play. But most of the in between, they will have a roughly a good idea say, I just want to be a better player. So this is a, a generally from the survey uh, to tell us uh, what the motivated, especially this group, uh, US uh, junior players, what, what motivated them to play. So theoretically, actually it's echo what the most motivation uh, in the sports psychology, uh, they tell us what's the, the, the influence of a junior player's uh, motivation and participant in the sport. One is the inner drive, the drive their motivation to play, the needs. The second one is how much autonomy a play control would direct the player's motivation. So they both are very uh, big influential uh, about how much uh, junior players will keep doing and keep uh, participant in this sport. First one is the needs. Needs drive everybody's motivation. At the same time, we can see that on the badminton court. So this is age difference too. So we have to, as a coach, as parents, we have to be very sensitive about the different age of the kids. They have a different needs uh, that drive them to be part of the sport. So their needs definitely different from adults, which is we always confuse and sometimes frustrated. Why the children just be mature enough? Because they are children, they are young player, junior player. So their needs is definitely different from adults. So for younger kids, the environment very, very important. The coach set it up very welcoming environment. Uh, the groups is very welcoming, uh, not judgmental. So safe environment, which will provide a very basic need. So they will be participant, they will come back to the club. It's just because that is the environment they feel very welcome. When a little bit older, social needs will be very important. So their friends uh, be part of the training group. So they want to hand out with their friend to be part of it. And then, uh, or they want to be recognized uh, by the parents, being loved to be recognized by uh, parents and coach. So a little bit older kids, especially young teenagers or preteen, the social needs will provide a drive uh, for them to participate. When they're a little bit older, especially older teenagers, they estimate lead. Uh, they start to have the identity who they are. So if you ask uh, 18 uh, elite player to ask, introduce yourself, one of them, one of the uh, character they will say is, I'm a badminton player. So they identify that, uh, be part of it. 
that will drive them to keep participating in this sport. So when you are trying to motivate your players, so sometimes this is inner drive will play a big role to help them to keep participating and keep uh, staying in this sport. The second uh, uh, influential uh, theoretical character to uh, motivate the ju junior to participate is from how much you've been in control, or how much uh, your autonomy you like to participate in this sport is from how much you love this sport. Uh, intrinsic as intrinsic uh, influence of you participating in this uh, uh, activity. So it depends how, how internalized your drive is. So low self-determination, which is will provide very low uh, innate internal motivation, high uh, compared to high in, uh, motivation internalized will be very, very uh, likely the keeper will uh, stay in this sport. So when you are very, very low motivation, uh, very low self-determination, so they don't like to do it at all. We all agree, we all love this sport. We think badminton is the best ever happened to the human history. But for some people, they just do not like it. So for those people, they don't have a motivation at all. So say goodbye to them, let her go, they can do something else. So we identify that, it was fine, it's okay. And then, Extrinsic, a little bit left uh, right side to the uh, motivation is uh, external regulation and which motivation is extremely external and regulated by either punishment or reward. So for a lot of kids, the parents would say, you know, if you training well for this hour and you did not lose your focus, you can have two more hours of a video game time after your training. So kids are doing that because of that reward. Okay, so that is extremely external regulation uh, for motivate them to play. And the next to it will be a little bit more autonomy, a little bit more self-control is uh, interjected regulation, which is, they will identify for something, will either protect their ego or try to um, please somebody else and which is motivate them to play, such as I want to please my parents or I want to, because I'm doing this because I don't want to disappoint my coach or I don't want to disappoint my parents. So that will be a little bit more control, but on the other hand, it's still dominated by uh, external uh, sources. So here is a cutting point. So after that, this is more self-control and autonomy. They were doing something a little bit for themselves. Uh, for most of teenagers, we'll fall into this two part. One is identified regulation. So thinking about your players, some of them, they were in this kind of motivation, they will like to think about uh, agree some value, which you want to keep that value or some purpose they wanted to do. So such as, I want to be part of the uh, uh, USA badminton team, because you know what? They will help me to get into better college. So if that is a motivation, that's identified regulation. A little bit higher for a lot of professional players or uh, under 19 players, they like to do it because, you know, I want to do it prepare for my tournament. I want to be next Olympian. So that kind of a motivation is uh, integrated, regulated motivation. So identif identified regulation or uh, 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 integrated regulation is very, very much self-driven, is uh, much more autonomy, but is still uh, motivated by external sources, sources. So you can see some player are intrinsic motivated, which is they like to do it for fun, they just want to challenge themselves, can do something good, or they just want to learn something new. So that they were doing this because they didn't really want to influence by outside of an external um, motivator, 
but by himself. So that's a, a purely intrinsic motivation. We can see that uh, in a lot of uh, club players. So especially adult club players, they like to do it because they just love to do it. They like to do it because they just want to learn this sport. Uh, they ignore uh, their result of the tournament. They don't care if their parents want them to do or not. They don't care their friends were there or not. So this is a pure intrinsic motivation. At the same time, I don't know if you guys remember, a lot of a young player under eight years old, nine years old kids, their answer about motivation is about intrinsic too. Fun. Uh, I like this sport because it's fun. So a lot of players, kids, uh, they started with fun, the very intrinsic motivation uh, themselves to play. So this is very important message I want to deliver here is a lot of kids started from intrinsic, motivated. They like it because they just love it. And once they love it, they start the training program. What happened is adults, parents or coaches uh, or the system externalize their motivation to something else such as trophy, uh, ranking point, um, reward, uh, all of this, they externalize that fun uh, from intrinsic to extrinsic. So when they started to have fun, they start training and then they go win the tournament. So they start to get recognized because they're winning. What they're gonna happen is they fall into that intrinsic motivation. So then, coaches start to suffer, the parents start to suffer, why the kids cannot win and they not motivate themselves because we have to be very careful about when they started to have fun and we have to be careful about driving them to externalize their motivation from inside to uh, outside uh, motivators. So, uh, it, 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 it will be much easier for coaches and, and the parents and if the kids are all intrinsic motivated, right? So they will love to just go, they pick up, they prepare their stuff, they just go. And we don't have to listen to their complaining. But uh, it's not a bad thing uh, if we provide some external sources too. So it's not always bad. So, but it's how do we direct them uh, to them, uh, to the young player? Uh, to increase their intrinsic motivation into that direction. If you still remember the chart from left to right, uh, once you fell off that fun part, you started to be uh, external motivated. So how do we direct it to intrinsic motivation? So that is the three components usually would drive us to prepare us better to love that sport uh, internally. First one is feel like you related to this group. So special especially for the young players, uh, human and social animals. So they like to be part of it. They like to be recognized. So if you still remember the Maslow, the triangle we're talking about, so the social issue will be very important. On the lower you provide a welcoming uh, environment will be important. So that will drive a player uh, to stay in training, to stay in the group, to stay in the participant uh, of the sport. The second one is to feel good about themselves, self-confidence, feel competence. So that will drive them to uh, keep doing and be participant. So uh, if we can give them proper training, the skill, so we will see a lot of player. If you play, if you train more, you play better because you know more skill, you enjoy the sports better. So competence would be another component to drive uh, a junior player to uh, the direction of intrinsic motivation. But most important, uh, the strongest predictor of a sport persistence keep coming back is autonomy. What is autonomy? It's about control. So people have the need to feel they are master of their own destiny and they have the least some control of their life. So most of the importantly, we would like to feel that we have the control of our action. So, especially for the young player, so for a lot of uh, uh, uncertain around them. So this is most important for them to feel like 
uh, the big part of it is something I can control. So control will be very important for them to stay in the sport and motivate them to be better. Okay, so uh, I want you guys to think about this. I asked the young player this question is, what does your excuse is when you not perform well? So another question I often to ask a coach is, do you think you can control winning? Is winning controllable or not? So when I ask the kids, what's your excuses for um, when not playing well, what did you blame? So for the US player, for this group of kids, I'm really proud of them. I have a very encouraging answer. One is I'm not physically fit. I was playing so well, but I was too tired with the second game. I can hardly move in the third game. I just physically unfit. You know what? I should probably run a little bit more before uh, to train myself to, to be prepared, physically prepared. So that is a very good answer because that's something the player can control. And the other strong uh, answer would be mentally. I said, uh, I'm not mental ready. I'm so anxious. I'm so uh, worried. So that is also a good answer because you know that is something from training. You can also control that and lead it to different uh, uh, direction, different performance. So compared to the answers like, I do not like the court, uh, it's because of pandemic or uh, the, the, the umpire is always unfair. So those answers, which is externalized, that control will not be good for them to motivate themselves to be a, a better player or, or keeping participant in the sport. So gaining autonomy, uh, we have to find a good uh, excuses. So we try to build a, a player to be resilient and uh, in control. So resilience is, is a very strong ability so which we can uh, recover and change, especially when doing the performances. So uh, from the previous research and also from the data, I get it from the kids. So, or you guys can think about this uh, when you are coaching a young player or adult player, when they lost the match or lost the game or not playing well, what are their common excuses? So first one is ability. I'm not athletic. I'm too short. Uh, I'm too dumb. Uh, I just play bad. So that ability is not that you can change. Its ability is a stay, very stable ability, and which is internal, is uncontrollable. And another excuse is, will be the task. Okay, the court is, uh, is too slippery. It's drafting. The birdie is too slow. So all of this uh, is because externalized, the blame on something else. That is a task ability, which is out of your control. Luck, uh, Americans like to say luck a lot. Uh, I'm just not lucky. I'm always on luck when I play the tournament. So the draw is not good, bad luck. Uh, my partner have stomach hurt, bad luck. So all of this, all three, ability, task, uh, difficulty, and luck, are all uncontrollable. So what is junior player or you as a coach can control? It's the effort. Just like the answer we got from the kids. Oh, the excuses is I'm physically unfit. I get tired. So that is effort. That is a something they can change. That, can, that is something they can control. So we wanted to direct the kids when they perform well or not well, we want to ask them to direct that, that kind of uh, excuses to more controllable. And from that, so they can build the resistance. So next time, so they can easier to bounce back. If you fall into the excuse of some uncontrollable, how can they change? How can they be better next time? All right, so how do we help the kids to find good excuses uh, to increase their motivation? So this is a several things I uh, put a list there, but first one is, I've been talking about that is after a match, after the training, you ask them, 
what, what, why you play good? What do you play good? What is the reason you think you play good today? So you wanted to find a reason uh, to internalize that, uh, to be something, uh, to uh, kind of reward the kids. That is the reason they can uh, control. Uh, also uh, give the player to form logical attribution. So we heard this a lot. Uh, a beat B, B beat me. I must be bad when I play A. I gotta lose when I play A. It sounds psychological, but it's not always true. Because, and also some logical attribution is, I play bad, but I play bad doesn't mean I will lose. Sometimes I play bad, I win too. So this is a, something we wanted to make clear. Uh, we have to have a standard that the logical attribution sometimes is not always true when doing the competition. And losing is not always bad because that is a, a, a opportunity for us to build that resistance. So the kids always winning, you don't have that chance to now uh, attribute what, what the right reason for you to grow, to be a better player. So ego, we try to find the uh, blame to protect our ego so we can feel better about ourselves. So when we play well, when we've been successful, we want to attribute to ourselves. I'm good. I'm very powerful. I'm, I work hard. I'm so strong. So you want to attribute success to self. But at the same time, when you lose, when not play good, and you like attribute to blame something else, uh, my partner, he, he or she is not, uh, not play well. Uh, the court is not good. Uh, the, uh, the birdie is too slow uh, because it's, I'm, too, uh, I'm too lazy, I'm too tired. So that is to protect your ego. So we were trying to attribute, be more, uh, to, to attribute that reason toward effort, what you can change instead of something you cannot change. And the last one, mastery oriented player. So the task, instead of a focus on what you can do, your effort can change, then winning or losing, what is your effort? Sometimes can change, sometimes you cannot. So we want to focus on what you can do instead of something you cannot control. All right, the second uh, kind of a theoretical base of uh, uh, gaining autonomy is uh, self-regulation. Um, I think I did that in the, I talk about self-regulation in last presentation or a lot of presentation I talk about this because this is what we as a coach, we were trying to develop our, uh, to help our uh, junior player to uh, achieve when toward the end of their uh, under 19, when they're under 19, when they have all of the skill they have, this is the skill they should have it too mentally. It's how do they self-regulate it, their training and the play. So self-regulation started with setting a goal, short-term, mid-term, and long-term. And the goal have to meet their uh, developmental status, uh, either physical developmental status, mental, psychological, and also their cognitive. So the goal have to fit uh, what they want to achieve and also their developmental, uh, pop uh, 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 development, developmental proper kind of a setting. And when you set a goal, so when doing the performance, we want to monitor the goal to make sure we will kind of achieve that goal. So what coach can do is uh, we encourage the player to uh, we can record the, the, when they play. And then after that, when we're watching that game, and we ask the player, why you do this? Why you have this move? What do you were thinking during this movement? So make them to monitoring their own performance. And then after that, especially after match and after practice or after the tournament, they have to have a chance to self-reflection and give the feedback. So what can we do to self-reflection uh, is um, we can uh, write a journal, uh, we can uh, have the partners to talk about it, 
to see if uh, we meet our goal or when doing the performance uh, or change your performance to meet our goal. So, and after that, we set different goal and set a different strategy. And this is going through it again. As a coach, when we started with a young player, uh, we can help them to do this. We talk to them to help them to set it up this kind of routine. But gradually, they have to start doing that themselves. So that's what I say. Self-regulation is also a training. We want the kids to achieve uh, toward the uh, junior year. So on the 19th, second year, they should be able to set up a self-regulated routine for themselves. So not only the perfect footwork they have to achieve and toward the end of junior year, this is my set they also have to achieve uh, through your uh, uh, guidance and the practice. All right, so how do we set a proper goal for players? All right, so zone possible development. Uh, so just assuming the pink part is all of the skill you want your junior player will achieve toward the end of a, a uniting. So strong backhand smash and uh, perfect footwork, a strategy to play, uh, and also how to uh, mentally prepare the stress and how to come back, all the little skill they have when doing under 19. But they cannot achieve all of the skill when they were under 11 or under 13. So for different age group, the kids will have different skill to already master, to, uh, to need to practice, and some skill will have to left until they uh, mature enough that we can practice. So for comfort zone is some routine work and that they already know how to do it. For example, for under 13 girls uh, being training for two or three years. So they probably, the comfort zone will be, they can, did, uh, they can do a very decent uh, deep clear. That's a comfort zone. So if you have an hour training with her, 45 minutes, you're still doing the clear, then she definitely gonna feel it is too much. It's too easy. I gotta put board. So deep clear is a uh, forehand clear. is a comfort zone for this uh, 13 years old girl. So for a strong backhand clear for under 13 or uh, no, 12 years old girl, probably will be a little bit challenging or difficult because physically they're not strong enough. So if you spend 45 minutes doing back and clear with something they're not prepared or they're not ready, they will be feel frustrated. So they're not gonna motivate them to do it better. So this is too, the challenge is too much. So for those kind of skills, we're probably gonna leave for a little bit until she is physically or mentally ready, they can start to pursue. How about backhand drop? 13 years old girl can start to work on the backhand drop. So, but they're not mastery yet. So what you can do is uh, a coach can have a strategy and practice and to make this kind of a, a, a skill uh, she's working on. So in this case, case backhand drop will be in the purpose, purpose zone. For this specific girl, this is something this is uh, uh, the skills uh, coaches can working on with her. So as a coach, we have to identify for each of the student or group of students that have a similar level or similar age. We have to identify some skill they already master, some skill you probably need to wait, and some skill and so we can working on. And this is the skills uh, it's proper for them to, uh, to develop during this period of time. All right, let's do a quick uh, activity. So you guys, as a coach, so I want you guys to um, name some skills for your 13 years old player. So a skill which they already master, a skill, number two, a skill they can work on with your help. And also a skill, do you think is too hard for them? 
and probably going to wait until they mature, either physical, mental, or cognitive. So uh, you can write your answer on the chat box. Okay, let's wait for some answers to your question in the chat box. Yeah. We have a lot of astute coaches in here, so they they probably have some answers coming up. Uh, they're probably busy typing away right now. <laughs> Could you repeat your question just in case? Uh, um, you need to turn on your mic. You. Okay, uh, three skill. First skill is it's very easy for a 13 years old boy or girl, 30 years old player. So some skill they already mastered. So you don't have to spend too much of time. And the second one is that skill you have to working on. Uh, with your help, they can achieve, but uh, without your help, they cannot, but definitely can working on. So some mastery goal you were setting. And the purple part is in the future. So that 13 years old cannot do it at this point, but probably when a little bit more mature, he or she can achieve later. Okay, so we have some answers here. David Cheng has said uh, for the first question, uh, forehand clear. Yeah. And for the second question, back and attacking clear. Uh huh. And then for the last one, he says backhand drop slash slice. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so Renee has answered one. Um, oh, I just realized it's in Spanish. So I'll, I'll have to wait for the translation to come through. Um, Bid Villain has said uh, powerful smash for one. Mm -hmm. uh, number two drops. Mm -hmm. And number three, back and clear. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, yeah, so, all right. Okay, with well, just uh, some um, uh, practice for you, for us. Uh, so when you get back to your kids, uh, your junior players, don't think about them. You probably have a profile for each of them. So that purple part is something you can work on. And that's the goal you were setting for them. So goal is the set, is set and you have time uh, to achieve that goal. So I will encourage you guys to use a tournament as assessment instead of use a tournament as a reward system. So tournament is not uh, the, 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 the medal, the trophy, or winning the tournament is not a goal. Winning the tournament is assessment, is a part of the uh, practice, a part of a, of a going advance. So uh, so this is a goal setting. So you can find the proper goal for the kids. So I, the reason I'm talking about this because from a lot of junior uh, training, we see um, a lot of, uh, especially in the US, a lot of uh, parents will get involved in coaching, so setting the goal for the junior. So they, they sometimes they will ask the coach, why you didn't teach my 12 years old girl back and clear? I want them to, to master that back and clear. But we all know this is going to be so frustrated for them because that is not, uh, they are not physically ready for that. And also, don't forget those kind of training, uh, we talk about skill, sometimes mental too. So for the junior player, we can set up different mental uh, preparation for them. Uh, to achieve. So for comfort zone for 13 years old girl, probably or, 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 or uh, boy or player, maybe some proper mental control, psychological control they should have. And some impossible will be a little bit hard for them. So we have to build it up that mental training as well. So Let's do some uh, final check of the how the how do we uh, set up the goal. So see, with you guys, we did your uh, goals or your your skill level for your players. So make sure it's mastery goal instead of a performance goal. So once you set it to that, uh, okay. So this is a skill we're working on. 
when doing the tournament, did he or she perform well of that specific skill instead of winning or losing? So we want to focus on mastery goal instead of the uh, performance goal. So we have to be aware all the time about their developmental status. So if these kids can really advance to the next level, so can to be a challenging, a more advanced skill. So we all know, so we know the kids sometimes they just grow fast. So they suddenly just play so well and let it stop for a very long time. And then they're probably gonna leap again. So that the developmental status is very unique uh, among junior players. So we have to be very aware of that. And then the sensitive about the, prog uh, the progress. So once they've been out of the purple zone, we can pick up some other more skills they can working on. Um, so we ha always have the same assessment uh, to evaluate their progress. So most important is listen to the, your players' needs. So talk to them, uh, give them guidance, listen to what their, their, their problem and the goal. So negotiate, not negotiate, but more, uh, set up the goal with them instead of for them. So in the end, we want them to self-regulate their own play. So listen to your players' needs. It's very important. Um, they, it finally, they have to do it themselves. So uh, communicate with them, let them know they have some control of their own training and playing. So it's very important. Uh, so of always being flexible. It's, uh, we provide an environment which is welcoming. So we would suggest uh, authoritarian, uh, authoritative kind of a, a coaching style, make it as uh, by direction. So the needs uh, could be, their needs you could, uh, you can consider and always be flexible, uh, consider their uh, developmental status and also their progress. All right, so this is uh, motivation is so important. So usually I have a several uh, message I want to deliver. Uh, one is junior is very different than adults. So their changing is constantly different. And of course, there's individual differences too, uh, gender differences too, and also cultural differences too. So we have to, uh, but basically we cannot use adult's standard or your adult's thought and mindset to uh, uh, ask children uh, to follow. So by direction inter uh, interaction would be very important. And the other one I would think that really very important to motivation is we wanted to uh, try not to externalize that motivation much. So it means winning or losing, that's important, but not the most important thing when they play for the play. So we want to decrease the importance of winning and losing instead of playing the task what can you do? Because basically junior until under 19, they have a room to grow. You cannot, no junior should be achieved when they're under 13, because we all know that we ask you guys to set up the goal for your player. Until 19, they still have room to grow. So we have to give them chance to, to grow. So um, winning or losing is not the only thing uh, they should be considered. So, don't externalize that motivation. I would think that was very crucial. And uh, the other thing is control. So I always ended my uh, presentation with the Star Wars references. So this is from the, uh, the master uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. So he doesn't believe luck because effort is what is something uh, we can control and that will change their uh, direction of motivation. Okay. All right, thank you for being, uh, stay with me and uh, may the force be with you. Thank you very much. We will now move on to the question and answer section. Please, if you have any questions or comments you want to share, write them down in the chat box. We will wait for some questions in the chat box. So um, in the meantime, while, I wait on, while we wait on some more questions, um, we know that parents play a very important role in the planning of sports for young players. Is there an ideal parent profile that you can think of? Um, I guess in terms of, you know, how much 
input they put in and how much input is required from the player? Yes, the parents definitely play a tremendous uh, role. And the parents, of course, they has an expectation of what it is. So uh, for instead of uh, the coach education, for, for my perspective, I always think the, <laughs> the athletes' parents should be motivated too, because when, especially when kids uh, love the sport and they are tenanted, they're very good at that, and they enjoy that. We have to be very, I think those kids are very, very, uh, you have to be extra careful about uh, to keep them that interest to do it. We see a lot of uh, young players uh, achieve very early on and they lost that kind of motivation. And uh, uh, so the resistance and persistence, I would think the, the parents and also the coach should trying to educate themselves. So the pressure, you have to let go about winning or losing. I know it's very hard. I, I have, a, I, my son is a junior player. Sometimes it's so hard to see him lose. I will walk away because I know that's gonna influence him. He's something he has to learn. So a day or two will pass. And then when you're losing, we're not that important anymore. But the most, more, more, more important is task. So today the tournament or when you're losing, did you learn something new? Even you fail or you're not perform as well. So that is also the learning experience. So uh, one philosophy I think is juniors, you have to give them room to grow. Nobody should be achieved when under 13. They should be achieved or they should accomplish when they're under 19, when they are much more mature. So we have to give them chance to grow. So at the same time, give them chance to fail. Fail is not the worst thing for the juniors because they have a much possibility in the future to be success. So it don't have to be success that early. So, all right, so we have a question here. Uh, what to happen if players keep losing matches? Should practice. Oh. Uh, so here is what happens if players keep losing matches and how to motivate them under certain situation. So uh, that is what we were trying to shift that winning or losing is about what do you achieve? So how do we encourage them to be stay on task instead of uh, the outcome? So task will be, okay, during the match, when we sit in the back, so it's like you focus on something. So especially young kids, they're very, very easy to lose their focus. So focus on something you can control, you can do, such as serve. You can serve well, then do it. Or, or something, you can do it clear, then do the clear. So after that, even then lose. Talk about what he or she already achieved. So that is kind of a, they make their control, there's something they can do. And for example, serving. So you give them a goal. So little Jenny, you not doing too good about serving. You usually lose five points in one game of a serving. So how about this time? After we practice for two months of a serving, maybe this time our goal is you make two, two mistakes and then that's a progress instead of a winning or losing. That's very hard for kids to focus on. So we target on task. Uh, so this is more uh, mastery oriented than uh, when you're losing that performance oriented. Okay. Uh, so are there any other motivation for the kids like to play? Uh, I don't know. I think it's a uh, lot of uh, kids like to play because it was fun. Will uh, uh, when they start compete, so that external reward is very important. So uh, then, well, something will be internal is their motivation for a lot of U.S. kids would be looking good on their college application if they were ranking number one in the US or represent the country. So that's a, another motivation for the kids. Um, so uh, I think they will have a lot of uh, uh, coaches here. What do you think other uh, motivation the kids will play badminton? 
this it depends whether the kids is goal going to be so if some kids be recreational so we give the the environment they just love to play have the kids have the friends but if there's more competition so there will be uh trying to find the proper uh tournament for them uh for challenging for them but not unreachable for them to play will be very important too All right, and then uh, I got a translation for this one. Rene, um, he's asking, mm. at what age or stage do you recommend the, the badminton player can go from intrinsic to extrinsic motivation? Intrinsic to extrinsic. Uh, I, I, I would yeah. think it's generally the opposite way around. You start from an extrinsic and move to intrinsic. Is, would that be correct? Uh, not always necessary because a lot of kids started to have fun. So a lot of kids uh -oh. actually intrinsic motivated. So unfortunately, we kind of externalize it, make it extrinsic motivated. So a lot of kids, because of fun and parents will say, okay, maybe you like to the badminton, so let's go training. And then we move them to the tournament. So when you move the tournament, it's all about winning. So that will make the, the badminton playing too external. So I, I, I will think, uh, I'm thinking about the junior players, uh, the different faces. So I will think 12, 13, probably it's a good time to introduce proper tournament because they have more skills than just very simple one. And they're a little bit mentally ready for that because of the younger kids, we can see younger kids have less uh, emotion control, uh, 13 will probably a little bit better to control their emotion, can think more logically. I was thinking when they get into the stage, be more formal operational, be more logical thinking, so you can talk to them adults like. So I think that probably we can introduce a tournament to them. So you can move toward a little bit external, but you still wanted to not to focus uh, a target on winning or losing. And still we have to let the kids to learn. You achieve a badminton, especially badminton. I, this is the best sport in the world, but I would think it's the most difficult sport in the world compared to you have to achieve so much to play great. So you cannot do it in six months. So that is why I would say junior, when they started 11 or 12 until under 19, 18 years old, it's probably about the time they can achieve all the physical skill, they can mentally ready, and they can start to have their strategy to play the whole match. So uh, the goal for that should be they can really enjoy play this sport when they are 19. They're very prepared for that. So um, this is a very good question because I think, I would think if it's short answer, I would say 13 probably is good to introduce in tournament, but uh, definitely we will try to very carefully to direct the kids how to, you know, think about this is not just a success in six months. So I, I see a lot of parents changing coaches. It's like, okay, I don't see, result. I don't see good uh, uh, of a medals or good uh, winning uh, from this coach and I change the coaches. So I, I don't really encourage that because winning or losing depends a lot of uncontrollable reason. But the uh, task and the kids progress is what we can do. So that motivated. Uh, I think at this point motivated coach and uh, parents too. Okay. And my good friend Adrian has a comment here. He says, I liked your presentation. He has one comment. Uh, I think that it is important that the coach stimulates autonomy and strengthens intrinsic stimulation. This will allow them to stay longer in badminton. Mm -hmm. And I guess he's saying the force be with you also. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one quick last question from David Chang. He says, how do you handle parents that care nothing about anything but I guess he has cared nothing about but winning that's very sad does it because I I see a lot of that and they put a lot of pressure to pair uh, to coaches and, and I think in the long term they put a lot of pressure to the kids and we 
uh, not only for the junior players, we see that pressure to win damage a lot of professional players too. So we saw the, uh, uh, Naomi Osaka drop out the US Open tennis. We saw the Simone Biles being cannot perform during Olympic because that pressure is not physically and they're not ready. It's the pressure to win. So winning is not necessarily a bad thing, but if too much of that motivation to win, it's gonna hurt. So um, the parents, you probably need to communicate with them. Uh, I'm not so sure for each parent, they probably have a, have a different tolerance about this because I think they want to see the result and they have different expectation about this. So you needed to uh, sit down with them, the parents and the kids sometime about what each of the expectation is and what is a reasonable expectation. Because I, like I say, winning is very hard to control because it's so many factors will affect that result. But the only thing you can control is what you can do. And we do not want to lose that because we're gonna lose that kid uh, and participant in the sport. And the sad part is that kids may like to the sport and that kid might grow as a world champion. But the point is drop out too early and the pressure too hard. So that burnout is definitely a, a, a issue. So I, I was thinking uh, educated parents is one thing and uh, give an example of a, something happened or, or a successful story or unsuccessful story uh, to think. I think deep down parents still care about kids more than winning. So I think it will be a, a good way to push on that. Okay. Many thanks, Dr. Smith, for sharing such an interesting discussion with us. It has been very enriching to talk with you and to analyze the different topics that occur currently in badminton. Thank you. On behalf of Badminton Pan America, we thank you for your participation and hope that you enjoyed today's sessions. Stay safe and stay well. <laughs>